Dogs of Warcry is a podcast from the Mortal Realms focusing on Warcry, a fast-paced cinematic skirmish game by Games Workshop. You can expect discussions on gameplay, rules, homebrew, lore, painting, terrain, narrative gaming, leagues, and events. Excellent. Excellent. Welcome, guys. How are you guys? doing? Great. Good. How are you guys? Doing excellent, excellent. Here we are in episode eight, season six. Holy crap, we're wrapping it up. It's crazy. Woo! Season six has been wild. It's been a <laughs> right? I mean, Lucky number long. seven coming, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Just around the river bend. That's right. right. Oh, That's my. right. And we're going to be talking about the second event we ran at Adepticon, you know, our deep narrative Woot Halls, so that should be pretty exciting. Uh, it was a small event, obviously, and um, you know, at least Joe Paven got to participate, but Paven's busy with fatherhood at the moment, so, so <laughs> unable to join us and, and add his perspective. So, but that's great, that's great. And of course, Vin here lent a lot of models, got to see them in use at least, but uh, but at least you get to find out a little bit more about it through this uh, particular podcast, don't you? Yeah, it's gonna be exciting. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right, well. Joe, what have you guys been up to in terms of the hobby? What's been keeping you busy? Uh, with the uh, recent addition to of Imperial Agents into 40K, I've been uh, deep diving into those and building so many, so many little. Uh, it's it's fun because I'm used to building humans in Warcry and Age of Sigmar, and so when you start building them at a slight like they're not a lot different scale, but you look at like Brand Zostforn, which I'm just finishing up building. Uh, to play in an event on the 9th that I'm excited to go to oh, uh, yeah. November. Um, but I'm going to be doing some Brands Oathsworn and uh, probably a couple other Dark Oath models in there. Or who knows, maybe, you know, the, uh, the monster. Thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's good to know uh, you're doing it because I was considered doing that, but now I won't. I'll do something, I'll do something different. I also <laughs> have Neve in the hopper in, uh, in honor of Paven's new baby. Uh, so, um, but no, I, I mean, I've got another couple things that I do. I, I did finish up building a bunch of Stormcast. So now I've got my 2000 point, um, Age of Sigmar Stormcast list. No, uh, right. no, um, cars I yet, uh, but, um, I've got the, I've got the rest of the infantry that I wanted built. So they're fun, man. I really just like be building the vigilers. They're just goofy and silly and great um and just cool looking models in every way um so those uh i helped i've been doing some helping with um some coaching on the early edition of kill team uh at time of recording it's been out for about a week and i've gotten a few games into that um and it's cool to see that scene go so well and watching the explosiveness of, of spearhead and age of sigmar mm -hmm. with uh the new edition explode I can only look forward to whatever is going to come next for Warcry because it's it's a good time to be a war gamer. Nice. Um, but that's what I'm working on. Um, lots of stuff on the table, and excited about all of it. Well, Joe, awesome. how about you? Oh my! Well, you know, first time on the podcast, so you know, I can Whoa! go back how far uh, <laughs> to what I've been doing. Um, so I'm not going to go back that far. Um, but I'll, I'll go back to Adepticon um, while I was there uh, for the event and the other Warcry events. I played in all three. Um, uh, I met with a bunch of people and uh, Will of the um, Path, to, Path to Story fame and I got to talking and uh, we had both talked to the same person that lives in Rockford and, said, and approached both of us and said, hey, do you know this person that plays... Uh, uh, Age of Sigmar in, in Madison. And no, I don't know that person. Do you know this person? No, I don't know that person either. And then that person said, well, how is it that I live in Rockford and I knew all these people that play in Madison and you live there and you don't know any? So that whole started all the... <laughs> Will and I got together and decided to set up a, an Age of Sigmar play group. So um, we started in April and um, it's actually grown quite a bit. Um, I think we've made it up to, we had 16 people show up one night. Awesome. Um, 
And uh, yeah, we're playing a lot of Spearhead, a lot of Age of Sigmar, um, Escalation League. We're, we've kind of been doing a lot of different things. Um, so that's it from the from the game side, from the hobby side. Um, my original intent was with 4th edition. I was planning on playing Sylvaneth. And then uh, <clears throat> uh, the rat bug bit me. So oh. I am currently knee-deep in building a bunch of Skaven. Uh, <laughs> and I can say that, um, you know, I'm 80 clan rats in and probably another 60 to go. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at now starting the base, you know, doing the basing pretty soon. And 160 little rats that I'm doing all the basing on is a rather daunting process. Right. So um, that's kind of where I'm at right uh, right now from a hobby standpoint. <laughs> You'll be a claw lord soon enough, Joe. I'll, I I'll, know, when right? We, when we hit 200, we have to have a clan, like, oops, all clan rats, the battle. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> if we ever decide to do an event where we need a whole bunch of clan rats i think we've got it covered true i've got some old school <laughs> clan rats too I can... yeah josh actually well, has huh? a ton too between pewter the, and plastic the baby pewter and plastic <laughs> how many do you think we have as a group of all three of us gosh oh, boy. <laughs> i think i'm good for go like with... 260 or so before we I get into just about 500 to 600. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, I've, I've got more than that. I used to have a 2000 war armor. Point armor, you know, army. Yeah. Slaves. Oh, but I thought you meant... then we had slaves too, but they yeah, had not H of Sigmar. I don't, I don't, I probably I don't have 2000 points. I have 2000 oh. clan rats. Like, oh, oh no. Oh, oh my God. That's a lot of clan oh, rats. <laughs> yeah. No, that'd be a lot. I did inherit a bunch from Paul. So, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I didn't count those up. So, I don't know. But. <laughs> On mm, next podcast, it will be about how many Skaven we have. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to count them in front of all of you, one at a time. <laughs> Prepare for the four-hour episode. <laughs> Still shorter than some of our other podcasts. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Well, yeah. Well, in terms of hobby for me, um, I haven't been doing a lot of playing lately, but uh, have been doing a lot of terrain building, especially since we'll kind of talk about later, but... Uh, War, uh, White Dwarf released this kind of a Savage Coast campaign that takes place near the Gnaw and, and the Parched, where Warcry is like in this ruined city archipelago area. I kind of got my terrain juices flowing, so I built a, a ship out of styrofoam, and I built some docks and planted to build a whole bunch of docks and houses so we can have some Warcry fun in a ruined uh, lakeside and coastal city area, so... And maybe get some ship battles going, like Vin and I have been trying for for a while. So this would be cool. That but, sounds awesome. Yeah, yeah. So I got some pictures on our Discord. So I'll try and share those a little bit more later too, as we get the podcast out. But but yeah, it's looking fun. So it should be nice. And also um, tomorrow, as of this recording, the day after, I'm running a multiplayer Halloween event at the at the store for the Warcry group. It's going to be a zombie, fungal zombie-filled funness, uh, you know, so it should be a lot of fun to see how people handle that. Who survives the longest? I'll, I'll definitely provide an update. <laughs> All the winners and losers for that particular event. <laughs> right, but yeah, like I said, I haven't played any games in a while, the recent campaign system anyway. Uh, I did get to play in the previous Warcry campaign, and that was a lot of fun. It was more of a tournament kind of base setting played the fire slayers for that but uh but yeah in terms of the currently zach one of our locals of course you guys all both know him, has been running it uh with using i think it was eight wild dice so or eight initiative dice so uh apparently it's been a lot of fun so you get to use a lot of abilities apparently so we'll, we'll see i think wow. i think he's planning to institute that for the multiplayer event tomorrow we'll see and then uh but yeah that could be quite interesting i'm sure and uh so you guys, I assume you haven't been playing any Warcry campaigns either, so we could probably skip the rest um, of the pack. I actually got or... to uh, oh, do a nice. teaching game. Yeah. Oh, yes. uh, one of my friends, so one of my friends and now avid listener, um, has uh, gave me a call and he's like, why don't you come on up and we can play some Warcry and I just want to make sure I kind of understand it a little better. Uh, so he played, um, he decided to play some uh, of his Stormcast. And he has, uh, it's, it's like a, it was a good, it was a good mix of different stuff. He had some, um, I think he had, it was all, uh, all the stuff from.
from last edition. So from um, the launch box, the last edition. So there was some um, Vindictors and just some of the random heroes. It was it was a good mix. And then I threw uh, Carrick Acolytes and or no, not Carrick. I did Zeech. Um, this was a few weeks ago now. So I did some Zeech demons. Uh, and we ran around and, and fought it out and, uh, I managed to squeak out a win, but it was, it was squeak a bloody out. endeavor. Uh, there was a lot of dead horrors and a lot of dead everything else too. <laughs> so. Oh, nice. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. Yep. There was, uh, let's see, we were playing on kind of a makeshift table cause we make jokes about it. He like make, made jokes about it. He's like, I've heard it on the podcast that so you'll play with cups. So I got some cups and brought them down. <laughs> well, we got it now. So uh, we set up. Um, it was funny because there was some terrain that was like actual terrain, and then there were actual cups with like books and stuff on them. And it was, it took me back, and it was so fun. Um, and That's hilarious. Like lots of learning um, on his end. He's hoping to come to our event at Depticon this year again, um, and he's he's just so pumped. And it's it's cool, right? Uh, We've all been at this for a minute. Uh, none of us are rookies on this on this podcast, and we might get out of practice. We might uh, not play as often as we play other games. Um, but to see a new hobbyist like really engage with Warcry is its own reward, and it's just so fun. So if you haven't played in a while, get out there, do do a game or two, because it it is a really awesome game. And it's just so smooth um, and so fun. It just it's wonky fun, right? Uh, a horror spiked its attacks and killed or like did the last wounds on um a vindictor and or the spear guy and it i was it was just like one of those things where i was like there's no way this happens and he spikes it and just gets rid of him i'm like well there we go <laughs> you know <laughs> so it was fun um screamers getting tackled by annihilators is is always a a, a gas like okay well i'm gonna move twice or, it, you know, he had, what did he have? He had the, um, he popped his quad and just like rampaged over and killed him. And I was like, okay, that's a cute screamer. <laughs> so it was good. Uh, we had a lot of fun. And, you know, it, it might not have been the most uh, crazy over the top thematic game, but, you know, the, the memories were made anyway. And it was just good stuff. That's awesome. That's Sounds really reminiscent awesome. of games down at the coffee shop. Yeah, that that's literally what he said. He's like, it was just like, yeah, we'll do it just mm -hmm. like the games used to play at the coffee shop. It's true. Um, yeah, uh, a couple of the guys from that that group that I used to play with just moved back not too long ago, so I should hit them up and be like, you should come out and we'll do some more crime. We'll go to the coffee shop. <laughs> right, definitely <laughs> fun. Um, I actually sorry. did get a um a, a teaching game in as well. Um, uh. I let that I let that person play my my legendary Iron Golems uh, warband, who I've played every year at Adepticon now, um, and I went in with the uh, <clears throat> uh, the um, oh gosh the the Nurgle one. It's the Rottmeyer I'm Creed. blanking on the name. The Rottmeyer Creed. There you go. Thank you very yep. much. Um, and uh, I was I was actually pleasantly surprised how easy it was to actually do a teaching game. It's, it is such an easy game to teach. Um, yes. and, and to really get somebody engaged with, um, I think that's for me, that's always been one of the draws is that's, it's just such an easy game to teach and then for somebody to grasp right away. Yeah. No, it's, it's so cinematic too, going back and forth and, you know, interactive, you know, it's, it, it makes it a lot easier to teach, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Still working on my, video issue here sorry but the, the yeah. darkness is speaking the power went out at josh's house again <laughs> yeah uh, oh man we've been plagued by te technical difficulties tonight we've been uh first my my computer is ancient it works on um, i'm pretty sure it's a in tech and i'm out of warp stone is really the problem here <laughs> and uh so it, it wouldn't update and i couldn't get in and so then I looked at my phone and I was like, I could try it on this and it's got like 4% battery. So we're just hopping it along here with a, the world's oldest standing charger that I've never used before, but it seems to be doing okay. <laughs> We've got doing our ducks. Great. They're doing great. 
we, we've got our duck. They were eaten by Chaos Warhounds and run into a different line or pile someplace else. But we had ducks once. <laughs> Not in a row. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right. Well. So, for the visions of madness. Uh, so, in White Dwarf 504, there's the Ravaged Coast, as Josh was talking about a little bit ago. With some new heroics, traits, uh, artifact loot tables, and unique quest rewards and encampments. Um, yeah, that's an entirely new campaign. Yeah, so it's like from like a well, you know, like if it was a new edition, you know, it's kind of what it would be like, you know, especially if it's set in actually right between after you know after the Age of Sigmar events here. I could mm -hmm. totally see that being part of the new edition. So it's kind of interesting that we got it now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. yeah. yeah. It's I and mean, hopefully it's just like a teaser, right? You know, like yes, we're we're yeah. moving, and this is their way of being like, hey, just so you know, this is what the games are going to look like here in the future, um, right? And then we also had the September surprise Warcry FAQ and updates. Woo! <laughs> that was yeah. wild. That was, was absolutely wild. Um, and surprise, there's a bunch of Stormcast and a bunch of Skaven and a whole bunch of stuff got updated. Awesome. That was yeah. awesome. Yeah. A lot of points revisions on Underworld Warband models and everything, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Lots of really cool stuff. There's been, of course, a lot of our fellow podcasters have been tearing through that content to providing new updates and re overviews of the, like, Brands of Oathsworn, um, you know, was, was one of those that Rule Sets released for, and uh, a, um, uh, one of the other Warbands, or war, Warbands like Warcry box sets for... Age of Sigmar 2 with the, the two characters in the book. I can't remember their name off the top of my head, but they came out with rules for them too. And yeah, so a lot of really good stuff. When um, when did they actually, um, I didn't actually um, catch what the timing was for it, but uh, it seems like a lot of the warbands have now been given like an ability. If you play the warband and every model that you play is in the same faction, then you get a faction-wide Ability, the battle trait. Yeah. The battle trait. Yep. Um, I didn't catch the timing of when that was actually added. Um, it was just a couple months ago, actually. It was okay. in um. Yeah, it was in White Dwarf, and yeah. um. Oh no, no, I'm sorry. It was in uh, Pyre and Flood. Uh, they added it in there, mm -hmm. and um. But, so there, there are battle traits for if you stay within faction or if you stay within Grand Alliance, you could also have that too. So if you took an ally out of faction, you could still have a Grand Alliance battle trait. There are a lot of a lot of unique aspects in there too. Some are definitely better than others, and you're like read one, and you're like, why is this this one, and that one is so much better? But you know, but it's really yeah, it's still a fun, neat concept to have, and kind mm -hmm. of overlays, you know, with with agreement of your opponent, overlays what you can can do normally. So that's really nice. Yeah, nice. It's some pretty cool stuff. I know Josh and I, um, and maybe Joe. We'll see if you're up for it or. Uh, what the plan is, but we'll be diving into those in a little bit more detail um, in our next podcast episode. Um, we're just kind of tapping on the the um, the things for Vision of Madness today. So we're going to try and get into the Adepticon planning and stuff and kind of a review from this year. Um, exactly. So, Circle of Paint. Josh, I can tell you that I have three more to paint for my treasure tokens. How are you doing? Uh, not so good. Uh, I've been easily distracted. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have my tokens printed. <laughs> As a long-time listener of the show, that means that Josh is going to win the the painting content competition. Oh, well, no, not this time. <laughs> not this time. I'd show you if my video was working. Uh, and <laughs> got it sitting right here next to my printer. I uh, had lots of ideas, and then, then I got distracted with, like, Coastal waters, and I was like, "Oh, maybe I should change my tokens to be something related." And I was like, "I'm not really fine." <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. I think we'll still, you'll still probably get them done before Eric and Payton. So, uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. So neither of us right. are going to win. Is really the answer. Mm. Um... <laughs> you will win because you're the only one who's completed it. <laughs> but I'll take uh, it. It's funny because yes, exactly. So I had started them, and then I like was like I only had like 
four of these, right? And I was like, no, <laughs> that's all right. No. So I like lost oh. two. So now I found them. We're okay now. Oh, good. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yep. They were then they were like half done. So I was like, I'm missing specifically X and Y, and I'm like, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> so we found them. They they were just they had gotten pushed in with some Admech when I cleaned my table, my hobby table off, as one Ad does. Mech. Where yeah. Where you just you know you do the put your hand on one side and go across until it's all oh. in a box. Oh my! Oh my! And that's, I that's, don't yeah. do that with my mom. <laughs> well, I was using a broom, but I got in trouble for that too. So. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah, no, I could not imagine doing that with them. <laughs> <laughs> If you play Skaven long oh, enough, Josh, my. it just happens. You just do it by oh, accident. Right. Oh, yeah. You're like, imagine. oh, yeah. here's 30 clan rats gone into the box. Put it on the shelf. <laughs> 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 All right. Now, uh, for today's victory condition, uh, this episode, we're going to talk to Josh and Joe about the Adepticon War Cry Deep Narrative event. Um. So, Josh, how is the event different than the Warcry narrative, which is our normal like uh, headliner event that we were doing? This last yep. year, we added the deep narrative, and it's not to be confused with like the deep state, but it is just as full of conspiracy <laughs> and intrigue. Right, right. Uh, so, we what well, we have been considering for a while is that lots of other like Nova, for example, is a really good event where they have um, some really interesting narrative events, which are you know, they have war cry, but it's not necessarily a war cry, two opponents across the board. It's a war cry is tied into this AOS narrative. And in, in this particular case, they have like these large ship battles. And once they start boarding, you play a war cry game. But they also have some side war cry games that affect the AOS narrative. And there's some other um, groups or organizations who do really interesting sort of, uh, you know, bring your own general. And they evolve throughout the tournament kind of, you know. So, this is, so we were kind of thinking like, you know, we really love the narrative event that we run and a lot of people really enjoy it. And, you know, we change it every year. Like you and Eric did an awesome job this year, adding new storylines and new artifacts and, and designing everything. Uh, but we thought, well, you know, there's some people who are looking for something that's just completely off the wall. So how about we try to do something like that this year? And, and so we, we spent some time brainstorming and, um, and then kind of came up with something that was unique and, but small scale because, you know, we were, play testing a lot of stuff and didn't want to throw like 20, 30 people into something that we had no idea was going to even work well. So, so we kind of capped it at 10, uh, 12 people. And I think we ended up having 10 all together. Um, and so we, we wanted it to tie into our bonus narrative event we did last year. We kind of did this large gnarl, gnarl oak tree event, a multiplayer event um, after our narrative events. And, and in the end, the, forces of destruction as you were knocked down the gnarl oak tree. And so in this particular, we thought, okay, it would be fun to carry that deep narrative here where that tree has fallen and is now exposed the, the root halls underneath the gnarl wood, which has been kind of described in the underworld's uh, setting itself. And um, so that's, that's kind of how we had the idea. It's like, okay, well, we can tie it into a previous narrative event and then make it something completely different as we dive into it. So, And we want it to be more unique and, um, you know, um, an, an interesting way for characters to evolve over time. So, oh, it looks like you're muted there, Vince. Yeah, so, uh, the overarching design of it, why did you choose this place for the story? Um, so you know, we kind of wanted to tie it in uh, to the previous area, and of course we're still in the Narwood, and, the, and our narrative event was in the Narwood, so we thought, well, let's keep it here. But we kind of changed it up a little bit where the setting was underneath the Narwood instead of on top of it. So you know, kind of like, okay, well, the under, uh, you know, Underworlds did it, let's, let's go down there, we'll explore that space a little bit, and then we'll add our own kind of unique twist on it. In this case, we kind of stuck, stuck with the... Uh, merger of Slon architecture, but also unique Nellwood sort of uh, terrain. So we had one or two tables, really, of a mushroom, you know, environment. So we had lots of large mushrooms and small mushrooms kind of decorating that, that area. And then we had a normal kind of Nellwood setting where we have very large tree with roots, but then we had normal trees and things around that. And then in the center table, 
we had the, the, the ancient Sloan construction, whether it's, you know, part of Talaxis or something different, we kind of left that open into the question. And um, one of the interesting things about this event is we wanted to kind of put a spin on it where people would think they were playing a normal Warcry game and then realize that they ended up having to work cooperatively to escape. So, Yeah, I, I think it was really cool to see how you guys did the storyboarding for this and just like as it grew and the directions you guys were taking, it was just, it was not anything I would have came up with by myself and uh, watching you guys just move through it was super, super cool. Um, could you go through the general format format of it? I know you talked a little bit about uh, how it all worked together, um, but if you just want to like take a little deeper dive in that, Josh. Yeah, sure. Um, so, so we kind of designed it around. Um, yeah, well, but both uh, Eric and I had tried to our original 2020 Warcry event was supposed to be kind of set in the realm that Paul designed. Um, you know, in uh, Trying to know the name, of course, slips out of my head. The Gibbering Dome. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so we had re originally designed a war cry event to take place in the Gibbering Dome with some interesting uh, outcomes. So we never got a chance to do that. And we're like, well, you know, it would be fun to do something like that for war cry where we have this space. And um, in the brainstorming we kind of came up with was, what if we create our own place where you know they. The World Cry War Bands find their way to either an ancient Salon ship or get teleported to a Salon ship, and it itself moves around. You know, so it, it, it's like a floating city that we still need to kind of work out: is it in space? Is it somewhere else? But then it, we can have it appear without, you know, throughout the realms, and then we could have campaign battles and settings in that area, and then you know, it, some indeterminate reason, whatever else, it teleports again and manifests itself in another room. And so we can keep moving it around to different places and different locations to change the campaign setting, but also at the same time have this unique Mordheim-ish city where there are these factions growing and, and contributing and, and maybe resources and other stuff. So part of the design of this was having people work cooperatively to escape what was happening to get here and teleport out. But we had each person choose an NPC to bring along, you know, and it could be anything they wanted. Uh, didn't cost any points. We, could, we provided a lot of example profiles that we could use. And the idea for this was the, to generate two different kind of narrative elements for one particular war band. And, we, and the, one of the unique things we did is we split the war bands roughly in half with the leader leading one half of the war band and the NPC leading the other one half of the war band. And we had what we called influence points. So throughout the games, you might find some objectives and treasures and other things like that. But depending on your narrative um, actions or other things that your, your warband did, you might be awarded influence points. And you could spend those influence points to have someone help you or to keep something alive or to persuade somebody into doing something else. And, and the idea is this, that you, your NPC and your leader accrued influence separately. And and the idea for that is at the end of everything, we had people, and we kind of documented who had what influence, which NPCs and leaders were alive, because some of them didn't make it. And um, what we're planning to do is design this initial city that they're all in. And based on who survived and how much influence they have, maybe they might be running like this, like the ogre and, and the uh, the Yeti that was with it had a lot of influence at the end. Well, maybe they're running like the arm shop or maybe they're running the butcher shop and the Yeti is butchering everything for the, you know, for the town, right? But they have this certain amount of influence. And, then, and, and so we would use the NPCs and the leaders and the amount of influence they have to kind of design what this initial world looks like. So that as it travels around, the people who take place in the events might go, oh, I'm going to the weapon shop to get some additional stuff during this campaign. It's from this guy who happened to be one of the originators in the campaign that we ran just, you know, at Adepticon. So we kind of did it as an initial world building opportunity and use influence to kind of help us drive how that might look and how much influence they may have on, the, on a council or whatever. And that's something Eric and I still need to kind of flush out in more detail. But, but that was the idea is to have this own unique place where we could build this world, but have it move around, but give it character that also evolves over time. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, from the outside looking in, uh, it seems like you guys nailed it, but who better to tell us than Joe who played in it? 
<laughs> right? He exactly. said it. Joe, what was right. uh, what do you think about the story? Like, give us some some feedback. So I actually want to start with um, I had originally um, not signed up for the deep narrative event because I had signed up for the competitive and um, uh, what I guess I'll term the not so deep narrative event. Um, so, um, but after talking with after talking with Josh, Josh was like, you know, it'd be really great if you came to play. So I'm like, okay, uh, I'm I'm going to come, and I am so glad that I did, um, because. It did end up being 10 people, and um, I think what what I really liked the most is that, okay, we had three separate tables, and as as Josh mentioned, we you had to split you had to split your warband in half. And as you when you place them, you had to place them on different tables. So now you were on two different tables, and more than likely with different individuals so now we were kind of going from table to table i'd go over here and i'd do an activation over here and then i'd go back to the to the other table where the other half of my warband was and i would do my activation over there uh maybe i do two depending on how far the other one's gotten along um and it was to me it was just so much fun because in in the normal narrative event i'm sitting with one person I'm playing against one person in each game. In this one, I was moving through everyone and interacting with everyone that was playing. So you really got a chance to know all 10 people that were playing during the course of that time. And I just loved that um, because it really gave you a chance to talk about your narrative with nine other people all at the same time, rather than sit down with one, talk about my narrative, sit down with the next, talk about my narrative. Um, I really liked that aspect of it. Uh, do you, uh, how did you find the mechanics? Um, the mechanics uh, were, <laughs> I will say, <laughs> so for me personally, um, on the, um, in my, I chose, I chose to be on the same table as Pavend. Um, and Pavend was playing his Stormcast, and his Stormcast were excellent shooters. And I don't know what he had against Iron Golems, but he was just picking off Iron Golems left and right. Um, um, but it was on the Mushroom Table. Um, and the influence mechanic, uh, I thought, was, was just so neat. Um, because um, the... Um, Eric and Josh were kind of walking around the different tables and listening to what was going on. And then based upon specific things that were happening within game would award influence. So um, one thing that um, pops into my head that happened um, on the, on the first table for me is that I ended up finding um, one of the artifacts that, and, and Josh, correct me, but it was like mm -hmm. a, it was like a hang glider. Um, I don't remember the exact name of it, Yep. Yep. Um, but it was a it was an artifact that actually uh, you would be able to move um, three times the distance that you were up in the air. Now this was the table that um, had all of the giant mushrooms on it. Uh, so I had used a rampage to get up to the top of this twelve-inch mushroom. And then we had a discussion about it um, that I needed to get all the way over to the other um, uh, to the other side of the uh, to one of the other boards. So we just talked about it, and Josh said, "Yeah, you can move thirty six inches, and you can completely fly across." So I did this whole big action of climbing to the top of the mushroom, jumping off with a hang glider, and flying across all the tables, and got awarded influence because it was just such a neat narrative piece. It was, um, and it was something that we could just talk about. Um, so I thought the influence mechanic was spot on. I, I just really liked how it worked. Um, and, and that's not with, without the knowledge of knowing what the influence was going to mean, uh, at the, at end. the end. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so we kind of kept it blinded too, because you know, we wanted people to play to their war wands, or you know, like because you were different people on different sides of the you know the tables essentially, because they never met until the very end. Mm -hmm. But you had different alliances depending on who you were with on in what place on the other sides of the boards, which is kind of fun to watch too. And you could spend influence, right? You could spend so mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, so because the Paven's nasty st Stormcast were picking off all of my. Um, all of my wonderful models, um, uh, we went into the second board, and now I used a couple of my influence to actually bribe someone to help me uh, take care of uh, uh, one of uh, Paven's um, right. Stormcast. Yep. So yep. it was currency, right? You could use it as currency to go, okay, I'll give you, I'll give you influence if you help me do this. Um, right. So it had, it had multiple, uh, multiple things that it could be used for. Mm -hmm. And kind of uh, related to that in terms of the mechanics, one of the things we designed is the the initial four or five rounds were kind of set up like a normal multiplayer Warcry game where there were four people on each board and there were eight objectives and people would grab the objective and they would get awarded something. You know, it could be an artifact, but uh, in, in multiple tables there was this, a, um, a power stone that which needed to be used on the center table to help open the portal to allow everybody to escape. So one person found that and they would get a certain amount of influence. But there was also some other components that were found on the center tables that helped rebuild the pylons that were needed to power the power stones. And so once people started kind of figuring out like, oh, this power stone is pulling me towards this direction, I need to go there, then people would start migrating that way. And then we had a mechanic where uh, a variety of wandering not really wandering, monsters started coming on from the edges to force people towards the center. And from at that point, they kind of funneled towards the portal doors. And eventually, you know, through trial and error, people found out, oh, this power stone goes here. And then it, it powers up the pylon that then these void beasts started spawning. And so they would have to fight the void beasts until they got all the power stones powered. And then the doors opened. And then they people also got awarded influence for those models that stayed behind with the power stones because they couldn't leave the sanctuary where the power stone was. They had to stay there to keep it powered. So everybody had to sacrifice, well, four people had to sacrifice a model and got us some additional influence for doing so to enable the rest to flee before all the void beasts and, and, and creatures kind of came down upon them. Just when you thought it was safe. Uh, well, Joe, it sounds like you mostly survived. Um, would you do it again? Uh, I would definitely do it again. Um, um, there were, to me, there were so many thematic moments throughout the course. Um, Josh, I, I don't remember the the timing of it, but there was a there was a a, a fog bank that moved through one mm -hmm. of the rooms. Um, as you so, in, you had to try and get out of the portal, right? You right. had to try and get through the portal, um, and so you had wandering monsters that would come out, and then you had. Um, a fog bank that was actually coming up and yeah, there's you like could a tell through the course of spores it. coming in from the edges. And, and if your model did not escape those initial tables quickly enough, there were, there were some doors that were closing slowly as the, the creatures were coming out, but also this spore cloud that was toxic and it would, it would overtake models every six inches if they didn't get, if they didn't, hadn't moved fast enough. So people at that point kind of realized like, Oh, I got to, I either got to take this model down with me because I'm going to keep fighting or I got to stop fighting and we're going to run because yeah, we need to get out of here. Yeah. I think actually my, my single most influence that I had was one of my little, uh, iron legionnaires. Um, I finally started playing a little bit more co cooperatively, I guess, uh, and did a heroic, okay, I'm going to engage all of these wandering monsters so that everybody else can get out because I've engaged all of them. Uh, and then I was overtaken by the spore cloud. So uh, mm -hmm. as soon as as soon as I willingly gave myself up, uh, pretty sure it was Josh that walked over and said, here's your three influence for uh, for willingly going to your death and letting everybody else survive. Um, so um, I think in the end, hmm, I'm pretty sure that less less than half of my war band actually actually survived uh, to get their picture taken at the end. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of people were in that boat. Yeah. 
there were some oh. people who were just like, I've got a plate of my war band and we're going to attack anything anyway. <laughs> right. Which is fair. <laughs> but yeah, so it was definitely interesting to see how the interactions change when mm -hmm. people realize, oh, this is no longer a competitive event. Uh, we need to kind of work a little bit together to try and maybe I still want to get these artifacts before you do. And, but, you know, but I really need to get over there. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Joe, do you have any thoughts on improvements or uh, anything you'd like to see? And uh, if so, would, would you like to see more of a continued event next event or a new, brand new one? Um, so, um, that to me, I think that might have been the um, the thing that really kind of solidified it for me in the end, and, and made it um, something that um, even if for some reason I'm not able to play um, in the next year, that I, I would remember it. Is we we spent some time talking after after it was all said and done. We spent some time talking about okay, what we've done is really c kind of created our own our own niche, our own piece of the world where now the sky's the limit that, that we can do whatever we want to do. We can create our own, our own lore because this is, this is a place that is kind of out away from everything else. And mm -hmm. for me, that was just so it was a, it was a, Oh, well, because I, because I played in this first event, I have now taken a, um, I, I've helped create this this whole new this whole new world the the start of this whole new world, um, so it's it's one that uh, I would like to see continue the way it was. It started. We did this. It created this world, and now we have to venture out in this new world, figure things out, and encounter new um, new adventures. Um, so yeah, I for me personally. I wouldn't want to see something completely new. I would want to see, yeah, something that's new, but something that starts from where we ended. That ties it in, at least. Yes. You know. Yeah. yeah. Um, because uh, to me, that's the whole. To me, that's the whole draw of the narrative side, um, is that I get to create my own story. Well, if I, if we've created this story, and I don't pick it up next year then where did that story end? Um, so um, I, I would, I, that's, that's the way I would like to see it go. Um, as far as um, things that, um, things that I thought worked really well, influence this currency, I, I thought was, was, like I said, I, I thought it was spot on. Um, it, it, it worked so well, uh, especially once we found out at the end, what, what influence actually was used for in in the i'll call it the new world um um so i really liked i really enjoyed that part of it um the other thing as i mentioned before is breaking us up into different tables and then having to play across across an area really made me engage with everyone else um um you know i i I think uh, if if I'm comparing it to the other narrative event and the competitive event, um, I I'm not I'm not a um, an extroverted person normally. So getting to know an entire group of people in the narrative event or the competitive event, I don't do that so well. But this was one that I I was I. I had a chance to engage with everyone because we were moving through one another to try and get to wherever, whatever we were playing. Um, but then as you're moving through, you're talking about, Oh, this just happened on this table and this just happened over here. Um, so it really, it, it kind of, I think engaged me more with the, with everyone that I was playing with rather than just one person. Yeah. That's um, awesome. Yeah. As part of that, we, Eric and I both realized that like we had two groups set up really well that they could alternate tables at the same time, but then the other a couple other tables where there was one person in one table and another person on another table, so they couldn't rotate quite as well for 
fluidity. So that's something we definitely have to pay more attention to because obviously splitting your warband in half and then also doing initiative for those different halves. And mm -hmm. it did add a lot of complexity. But uh, I think once we got the hang of it, everybody was like, okay, this is what we're doing. We move here, we move here, we roll here. And then it got much easier. But again, for a for non-standard war cry, it's like, okay, I got to double everything. They got different wild dice. They got the different things, you know. It, it it was a little tricky to you know for people to kind of keep track of at first, and there were right. some things I think for efficiency we could kind of change up next time. But and the other the other thing to consider here too is that okay I I I never want to dictate what uh, warband someone should bring to a narrative event. So um, one of the one of the people in the event was playing cities and was playing a cities um, list that had fifteen. Yeah, fifteen models. Yep, the max. Mm -hmm. So you know, splitting it, he had eight models on each table. That's a lot of that's a lot of activations for that person to have to worry about. Me, I'm playing iron golems, and I had seven. Uh, mm -hmm. And with mm -hmm. the NPC, I had eight, so I only had four on each table. It's gonna it's going to make the timing of such a, a little trickier. Um, um, but the the only way to really address that is to is to try and enforce some kind of a limit and that's not something that i would want to see done because then i think you're really taking away from somebody's ability to uh to engage the narrative and play what they want um yeah um the the i think the one thing that i i, I recall that I'm like I wish that we could do this a little differently um, was um, space and how much space that we had. Now, I, we wanted mm -hmm. to be able to try and stay close enough um, so that you didn't have to walk, you know, halfway across the hall in order to go to the other table that you're playing at. Um, but a little bit more space, I thought, um, because there were times where you were... Um, you were a little cramped for space. Yeah, um, especially when so, everybody was on the two center tables. Yes, was, exactly. Yeah, everybody around two two war cry boards. <laughs> right. Um, so that I guess that would be the one the one thing that I'd go okay I, if if we could find a way to have uh, a little bit more space for people to work in because yeah trying to roll dice when all of us were around those two tables was. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was a little bit more diff challenging. Yeah. yeah, definitely the void piece and you know, everybody's individual war bands and yeah, so definitely mm -hmm. splitting yep. that up and allow you know, you, they, they could technically be separated though visually it's fun to have it kind of close, but yeah, it mm -hmm. got a little crowded. <laughs> yeah, um, but overall, I, I I thought that that um, that uh, Josh and Eric did such a great job being flexible. Um, you know, obviously a lot of planning went into this. Um, to to create to create this whole scenario, um, and uh, the one piece that um, that sticks into my head um, right away was uh, the void beasts themselves. Um, the the void beasts um, once they started coming out um, uh, started um, really kind of tearing people apart. Um, <laughs> so immediately. Um, uh, Josh, I, I remember jo Josh actually stepping in and say, okay, oh, we're yeah. going to reduce what the, the amount of damage that this one's doing, which is great because, you know, again, a lot of planning went into it, but being flexible in the moment to go, okay, this isn't playing exactly how we wanted it to let's change it to this. And, and just kind of rolling with the punches, um, was the perfect way to handle, to handle that situation. Yeah, yeah, especially not having chances to play test things. It's like we don't know how bad this is going to be. Oh, yeah, that's that's rough. Okay, yeah, right. yeah not. <laughs> yep, too too nasty, too nasty. That's good though. Yeah, people people were willing. Again, a great group. And completely, you know, we we had lots of disclaimers, but people completely understood and like nobody got upset about things. And it's like okay, let's let's do this. Okay, that that sounds great. Negotiating with other people, asking questions. It, you know that that's definitely what makes the narrative events is everybody's in it, creating right. the narrative together, creating that story together, and it's not it's not about winning or losing at that point. It's about okay, what's happening here? How are we gonna have fun? And where's it going? Mm -hmm. Which is awesome. You know that's exactly what we wanted. 
But I mean, I'm just really, really glad it turned out as well as it did. And you guys, you know, you put in the work and it, it, there were definitely learning points to take away, but I'm glad that it, you know, it doesn't feel like anything's diminished in it. And it seems like it was a fun event. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend, but I'm glad that you guys had fun when you were there. Yeah, no, um, no, definitely. Would you guys, as far as events like narratives, uh, is that something you guys would look at more of? Is that something you'd want to do smaller events? Is it something that you think you could scale into like, you know, a home game league, right? Like the, the mm -hmm. beer and pretzels mm -hmm. hangouts. Uh, well, Eric and I have talked a bit about that and um, he, he ran an event a while ago that I helped with called Plunging Spires where, um, it, you know, it was it took place kind of off the grid and, and these pillars kind of went up and down, but world bands would travel from one pillar to another. So you never quite knew who you were fighting, but you could choose your path if you won your game. And we talked for a while about having that be something like a, a realm engine that kind of moved to different places. And, and so this was kind of our bridge to that idea where we'd have this space that could move around and we could have, you know, campaigns set in our, you know, in the mana scenario that contributed to this space. And we could run another event that, that that happens in this space or wherever it's at so that we can continue to tie either larger narrative events like, at, you know, Adepticon or whatnot, or even smaller local league sort of like eight-week run maybe tells a story about one particular area of the city or maybe it's in this particular place. How does this league contribute to what's happening there? So we, we think it'll give us a lot of flexibility to grow that with a lot of different people, you know, and, and then kind of creating a unique space that we can keep tapping into if we want to. So. Um, so for someone, so I played um, all three events. I played the competitive event, um, the, the not so deep narrative event, and then the deeper narrative event. Um, and after doing that for the last two years, I have to say, uh, um, I the narrative the narrative event is is so much more of a positive experience um because the competitive the competitive is what it is um it's um it's good to play competitive games but every once in a while you're going to run up against someone who really it's important for them to win um and when they don't um there's some feel bads there um and it, you know it, it it creates an atmosphere that is a little bit more stressful, a little bit more tense. I never get that in a narrative event. In a narrative event, everyone is just there to tell a story. So if you know if they completely get wiped off the board in turn two, that they're just well, that's just part of the story. That's the that's the story that the desi that the dice decided to tell. So I tell the story. And I move on to the next one. Um, so, um, you know, I, I I think that doing more narrative events, um, I think just creates more of a positive atmosphere for the community in general. Well, I definitely think, I mean, and certainly we all play Warcry for different reasons. So a lot of people you know the the war band building aspect of you know competitive events is, is what you know they enjoy the most and seeing mm -hmm. how it works on the tabletop but but obviously that's you know the dogs of war cry podcast is all about narrative gaming and how we in, in introduce that and 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 share that with others and so mm -hmm. we certainly think it creates a positive experience and and i'm glad to hear that because we certainly it, try to yeah. encourage that when we're running the events in terms of you know have a good time you know we're here for fun sort of thing so and it certainly feels like we have that most of the time. So that's good. Yeah. Well, guys, I think with everything we've talked about today, I'm excited for our next episode uh, where we'll kind of dive into um, the new new settings we talked about a little bit earlier in the White Dwarf. And we will start to talk about what our, our pre-planning steps are going to be for this next uh, Adepticon. Um, it was really awesome to have you on today joe and hear your thoughts mm -hmm. on our events it was super yep. fun 100 percent we'll uh try and get you back here again um, definitely and hopefully you'll get to see my mug next time you know to... <laughs> <laughs> the watcher in the dark <laughs> all right right uh no i appreciate appreciate the opportunity to come on and actually talk about the event because i like i said I, I really did enjoy myself um so 
uh, the opportunity to actually relive it and talk about it is a good one. Yeah, thanks right. for being a guinea pig. We appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you guys want to talk to us, uh, reach out to us directly. You can find us on the Discord at themortalrealms.com slash Discord. Um, <laughs> otherwise, feel free to leave comments in uh, the video description or uh, like, comment, subscribe, as the kids say. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. Josh, where do they get a hold of you? Yep, uh, at the Discord. Uh, but you can also shoot us emails at dogsofwarcry at gmail.com. And you, Vant? Uh, I'm uh, pretty much only on di the Discord these days, but uh, you can. Uh, I'm D O W Vint on Discord. So it's easy to find me. Dog. Got that Dogs of War Cry thing in front of my name, and I'm bad at Discord, so it's my name everywhere. So if I'm in another <laughs> Discord with you and you see D O W Vint pop up, it's me. Uh, <laughs> but. And how about you, Joe? You get a. You Definitely the best place to get a hold of me is uh, is the Discord uh, as uh, Celtic Joe, um, and uh, I pretty much live in the uh, uh, in the Warcry and uh, um, AOS Path to Story uh, channels, rooms, whatever right. you want to call those things. Um, awesome. Um, yeah, that's definitely the best place, best place to get a hold of me. Great. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks everybody yeah. for listening. Yeah. All right. Bye, guys. Take care. Bye. Cry.